What are some of the dumbest decisions people will make? Let's find out. Starting with number six, influenced influencer. Miami police arrested self-proclaimed Cuban Kim Kardashian, Catherine Ferrero, for driving under the influence after she blew past a stop sign. Ferrero's breathalyzer test revealed her blood alcohol level was over twice the legal limit. Before the arrest, the influencer, who had 5.3 million Instagram followers, partied at the 11 nightclub. She left the venue and got behind the wheel, but her dangerous driving caught law enforcement's attention. A police car flashed its lights and tried to pull her over, but she attempted to flee. When she eventually pulled over, she was booked into the Turner Guilford Knight Correctional Center in Miami-Dade County. The influencer, who was known for sharing revealing pictures of her allegedly natural curves, told the Miami Herald that she didn't understand the interest in her arrest. Ferrero said that her followers liked her because of her content and implied that there was no reason for the incident to make the news. The Kardashian wannabe went for the title of World's Best Booty in 2015 while building up her following on her racy Instagram account. At the time, she bragged about her body being 100% natural. With her public persona, it's easy to tell why she didn't want the bad press. But in a world where an Uber is just a click away, there's no reason to ever drive drunk. Please, don't drink and drive. Number 5. Photo Shooting Cop The Miami Beach Police Department suspended police officer William Beaker after he appeared in an inappropriate video featuring women in lingerie. The video went viral on Instagram and featured Beaker escorting three handcuffed women in their underoos to the front doors of the department's headquarters. It was a mock arrest staged by women working in the adult entertainment industry. They approached Beaker and asked him if he would star in their skit. He happily obliged. The women called Beaker Officer Bill and thanked him for letting them go. Then he drove away in an off-road police vehicle. When it was over, the women, dressed in their skivvies, thanked him for participating. The videos received millions of views on Instagram, prompting an investigation at Beaker's workplace. Miami Beach City Manager Jimmy L. Morales called the videos offensive and expressed his disgust that a representative of the Miami Beach Police Department would conduct them in such a manner. Morales claimed that Beaker's actions made a mockery of his department, which worked hard every day to protect the community from heinous acts, such as the content featured in the video. Beaker had worked for the force for 11 years when he was placed on administrative duty. A day later, he was suspended. Police Chief Richard Clements suspended the officer while the department's internal affairs unit investigated how the officer got involved in the skit. The video brought unwanted attention to the Miami Beach Police Department, which has spent a decade trying to to clean up its image after facing multiple controversies. Miami being known as a notorious entry point for smugglers, as well as a surprisingly higher crime rate. It's higher than both New York and LA, which is surprising. Back in June of 2011, police officer Derek Coolin and a partner mingled with a group of women celebrating an upcoming wedding. He offered the bride-to-be a ride in his ATV and drove her onto the beach. A few blocks away, Coolin's ATV struck a couple who had just left the water. Both of them sustained serious injuries which required multiple surgeries. Even worse, Coolin's blood alcohol level was above the legal limit. He was charged with driving under the influence, reckless driving, and causing bodily harm. Five weeks before the scandal, officers from multiple departments fired over 100 rounds into a slow-moving vehicle they deemed to be a threat. The driver inside the vehicle lost his life. Since the department was desperate to avoid more controversy, it's clear why Beaker was placed on leave. One of the women in the skit, Playboy model Francia James released a statement defending the disgraced officer. She said it was harmless and he was nice and respectful. James also stated that she didn't think he did anything wrong by agreeing to film with them. What do you think? Did the cop do anything wrong? Was his decision to participate in the skit dumb? Tell us what you think. Number four, just for YouTube views. YouTube prankster Gerard Nadella was filmed threatening to blow up Britain's Newcastle airport. He entered the terminal building, walked past the check-in desks, and announced that he was armed with an explosive device. He then started trying to imitate words in Arabic. It was nothing but a dumb prank. Nadella and Andre Antonio, who filmed the whole thing, wanted to upload the prank to YouTube to get views. But members of the public and airport staff didn't act alarmed and really didn't give the pair any kind of reaction 
than they were hoping for. Instead, security staff and police officers swarmed and arrested Ndella and Antonio. The investigating officer, Detective Inspector Steve Byrne, commented that carrying out a prank of that nature was completely unacceptable and stupid, as it came with a prison sentence of up to seven years. The pair pleaded guilty to communicating false information, which sounds like a really weird way to say that, right? During his trial, prosecutor Rachel Glover even pointed out that the way Ndella used the Arabic language as part of his announcement that he had a bomb encouraged hostility to Arabic speakers in public. Judge Rippon stated that it was idiotic to carry out a bomb threat with the hope that it would frighten and distress the people around them, which is true. It's even dumber to think that you could then upload the footage on YouTube, which would basically guarantee you would be sent to jail. Antonio's defense claimed that at one point, Antonio told Andela not to go through with the prank because Antonio's not a homie. What a rat. Antonio and Andela both were found guilty. Andela was sentenced to nine months in prison, suspended for two years, and 200 hours of community service. Antonio received five months in jail, also suspended for two years, and 150 hours of community service. And really, they're lucky that's all that happened. Why on earth, in the current age, would you make any kind of threat about airplanes, especially when there's guys like these around ready to take action? Number three, the poor dog. Surveillance video showed Instagram model Kivana Wilson kicking her dog in an elevator. Wilson Shih Tzu, Chastity, suffered multiple bruises on her stomach. Miami-Dade Animal Services removed Chastity from Wilson's care and put it up for adoption. Wilson claimed she was mad that her dog peed in the elevator and never meant to seriously harm her pet. Wilson was charged following the incident. She addressed the case on her Instagram and apologized to anyone affected by her bad choices. The Instagram personality said that her actions were disgusting disgraceful and that her behavior that day had caused her a lot of hurt. She said she wished she'd never let her anger dictate how she treated her defenseless small dog. Wilson said she took anger management classes after the ordeal to find out the root of why she overreacted in such an intense manner. Part of her decision, she claims, came from the fact that she lost her best friend and hoped her situation would be a lesson for herself and anyone else struggling with anger issues. Wilson vowed that she would help mistreated animals and keep her followers updated on her progress. She also posted a video of Chastity saying she would always love her. She agreed to a plea deal, which included four years of probation, paying a $600 fine, and writing a letter to the court addressing her behavior. Yeah, don't kick any animals. And deaf don't kick any animals on video. Number two, the tree thrower. Camilla Grabska sued an insurance agency over seemingly debilitating injuries she sustained in a car accident. Less than a year later, cameras caught her participating in a Christmas tree throwing competition. Grabska sued RSA Insurance after a 2017 crash that she claimed caused her life-changing injuries. She said that she suffered from severe neck and back pain that prevented her from holding down a job or even carrying her young children. The 36-year-old quit her job shortly after and received received disability payments. She argued that she lost $500,000 in past and future income as a result of the accident. But in January of 2018, less than a year after her accident, Grabska competed in a Christmas tree throwing event where she launched a tree into the air and showed no signs of pain. Not only did Grabska participate in the competition, but she posed with a plaque after throwing the five foot spruce tree as far as she could. Because it's not enough that she throwing trees. She needs to get photographic evidence of her throwing tree. As a result of the photos, Grabska lost her $800,000 injury lawsuit. The judge said that Grabska appeared to have exaggerated her injuries and dismissed her claim. Grabska denied faking her injuries in court and said she was just trying to live a normal life. And by trying to live a normal life, she meant live a normal life by throwing trees, like you do. If you're claiming you can't do something, then you get pictures taken of you doing that thing, you deserve what you get. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here to find out how she tried to play like she was a business guru. Number one, above the law. Body cam videos caught Oklahoma State Representative Dean Davis in handcuffs, screaming at police that they couldn't arrest him because he was a politician. Davis might have thought he was above the law, but officers disagreed. A confrontation occurred late on a Thursday night when the Republican politician and his friends refused to leave a bar that was trying to close. Davis's group kept drinking on the outdoor patio, prompting the cops to arrive on the scene. Police told the group to leave the closed business, but they refused and became confrontational 
Educational. Officers arrested the clearly intoxicated Davis, who demanded they call their supervisors and threatened that there would be consequences for their actions. He claimed he couldn't be arrested during the session of legislature and congratulated the cops on targeting the wrong person. However, the police felt that they actually had the right person. Davis refused to back down, even when he realized that law enforcement didn't care about his title. So, the determined politician pulled out his wallet to prove his legislative credentials and warned the officers that they had made a massive mistake. He demanded to know how the officers could arrest him without forcing him to take a breathalyzer test. To which the arresting officer explained that Davis was slurring his words and that he stank of alcohol, Jimmy Fallon style, making it clear he was heavily intoxicated. Despite the fact that Davis is clearly above the law, the cop had a different opinion and Davis was soon in the back of a police car on his way to jail. Although Davis insisted that the Oklahoma City Fraternal Order of Police would have his back, the group surprisingly sided with the officers instead and stated publicly that the state representative's arrest was justified. This was Davis's second time being booked as he was previously accused of driving while impaired, speeding, and obstructing a police officer. And all the restaurant workers rejoiced, right? Seriously, as a little side PSA for those who don't know. When a restaurant is closing in 15 minutes, that means it's closed. Trust us, you don't want anything from the kitchen that late. Shout out in the comments if you agree. When will the dumbest criminals ever learn? The answer is never. Let's find out who the dumbest criminals are, starting with... Number 7. CEO of Real Bosses Don't Do This Jasmine Clifton from Charlotte, North Carolina is definitely in hot water with the feds. They hit her with federal charges for pulling off a scam to steal nearly $150,000 in COVID-19 relief funds from the U.S. Small Business Administration. She thought she could fool them by submitting false information for an economic injury disaster loan for her online clothing business, Jazzy Jazz LLC. But her scheme didn't fly, and now she's grounded. Clifton got crafty and submitted forged documents to beef up her loan application. She cooked up a fake tax document and cooked the books by inflating her revenues. Talk about playing with fire. She had the audacity to claim that her business, Jazzy Jazz LLC, was a victim of the pandemic, even though she had shut it down months earlier. Clifton managed to score a cool $149,900 in disaster relief funds. The whole point of those funds was to help struggling businesses hit hard by the pandemic. But did she use the money to get back on her feet? No way. Instead, she went on a wild shopping spree, hitting up fancy stores like Neyman Marcus, Nordstrom, and Louis Vuitton, and even splurging at diamond stores. What's truly mind-boggling is how Clifton tried to portray herself as a hard-working CEO and a self-made entrepreneur. She took to social media bragging about building her business from scratch. She even had the nerve to brush off people asking for loans or favors, acting like she was all about that independent boss life. Clifton's actions finally caught up with her when a federal grand jury indicted her on charges of wire fraud and fraud related to major disasters or emergencies. Number 6. 10 Weddings and a Prison Sentence Liana Berrientos, a New York woman with a penchant for serial marriages, went on a decade-long spree of tying the knot with multiple men simultaneously. This bride, a 38-year-old blonde, astonishingly managed to get married a staggering 10 times since 1999. In 2002 alone, she exchanged vows and said, I do five times. The lingering question, however, is why she never bothered to get divorced from any of her husbands. Authorities soon discovered that Barrientos wasn't seeking love, but was actually involved in a marriage-for-hire immigration scheme. In 2006, authorities even deported one of her husbands due to his concerning statements against the United States. This incident raised alarming concerns about potential security breaches 
and the ease with which the system could be manipulated. Barrientos managed to dodge detection for years by altering the spelling of her name on marriage licenses and filing marriage documents in various locations throughout New York State. She deliberately sought out men from countries that were deemed red flags for immigration, including Egypt, Bangladesh, Turkey, Czechoslovakia, Pakistan, Mali, and Georgia. At times, she was astonishingly married to a total of eight men simultaneously. In a weird attempt to cover her tracks, Barrientos boldly claimed on her 2010 marriage documents that she had never been married before. She even insisted to investigators that her marriage to a man named Sal Keita was her first and only marriage. However, further investigations revealed the truth behind her web of lies. Barrientos, who has children from different fathers, faced charges related to falsifying official records. She pleaded not guilty to two felony counts of filing a false instrument. If convicted, she could be sentenced to a maximum of eight years in prison. The involvement of the Department of Homeland Security in this case obviously shows the seriousness of the investigation. The fact that she was married to a man who was deported due to threatening statements raises valid concerns about potential national security risks associated with her actions. You'd think that being married that many times would be punishment enough for everyone. Number five, no smokes left behind. Robert Tutaki Kemp from Bell Block in New Zealand found himself on the wrong side of the law. He became embroiled in a burglary that resulted in the theft of over $5,000 worth of stolen property. Kemp's criminal actions unfolded in September 2017 when he targeted a residence in his hometown. With a determination to gather as much loot as possible, Kemp forcefully entered the house by smashing through a window. Once inside, he ransacked each room, sifting through drawers and cupboards and scattering items in his search for valuables. However, fate had a twist in store for Kemp. He left an unsmoked roll your own cigarette at the crime scene and little did he know that this seemingly insignificant item would become the key to solving the crime. Forensic analysis of the cigarette revealed Kemp's DNA leading to his arrest. This burglary wasn't an isolated incident in the area. Other homes had fallen victim to similar break-ins around the same time, prompting the police to issue a warning to the community. Authorities suspected that Kemp's criminal activities extended beyond the single offense for which he was charged. The style employed by Kemp aligned with the patterns in other burglaries. In particular, the burglar had a habit of searching bedroom drawers and targeting valuable jewelry. The accumulating evidence strengthened the suspicion that Kemp was involved in multiple thefts. During his trial, Judge Chris Seigrove acknowledged Kemp as a repeat offender with a lengthy record of criminal charges. In light of the evidence and the nature of the crimes, Kemp was sentenced to two years in jail, subsequently converted to 12 months of home detention. As part of his punishment, Kemp spent some of his detention in a rehabilitation facility in Auckland. Additionally, he was ordered to pay $200 in reparation to the victims to cover the insurance. Do you think this is enough to get him to quit smoking? Number four, gambling with time. Hype Kong Van and Thai Min Fan orchestrated a scam that tricked an Oregon retiree known as RW into loaning them over $3 million. The unsuspecting retiree believed he was making investments in a landscaping business based in Colorado and covering legal expenses. Except by landscaping business, Hype and Thai meant funding our extravagant lifestyle. For several years, the deceitful couple indulged in a life of luxury in Las Vegas, frequenting renowned casinos like the Bal Caesar's Palace and MGM Grand. They went on a gambling spree that saw them squander approximately two and a half million dollars of the ill-gotten money they had obtained. Van, posing as a struggling Colorado businessman, painted a desperate picture of a business on the verge of collapse. He even went as far as saying he was thinking of ending it all, leaving the retiree with little choice but to extend a helping hand. But their deceptive endeavors were eventually exposed when the IRS caught wind of the scheme. The couple's extravagant lifestyle in a Las Vegas suburb came to an abrupt halt as they were arrested and transported to Oregon to face charges in a Portland courtroom. Interestingly, even after their initial arrest, Van couldn't resist the allure of gambling. While awaiting trial, he returned to the world of casinos, displaying a complete lack of remorse and a failure to learn from his mistakes. During their court proceedings, Van pleaded not guilty to charges of conspiracy to commit mail and wire fraud, but he was ultimately sentenced to 37 months in federal prison. Van also faced the consequences and received a sentence of 21 months. Sounds like Van is all practiced up to gamble with cigarettes. Number three, getting paid to no show. 
In a shocking display of incompetence, a group of eight psychotherapists operating in the city managed to swindle over $600,000 from hardworking taxpayers. These so-called therapists, including a duo employed by the New York City Department of Education, were entrusted with a crucial task, providing essential therapy sessions to children in need through programs like the Early Intervention Program. However, instead of fulfilling their responsibilities, they chose to engage in a scam involving forged signatures, concoct false claims for sessions that were never conducted. The impact of their deceit was truly disheartening, as it resulted in approximately 200 vulnerable children being denied the vital treatments they deserved. This fraudulent scheme persisted for an astonishing length of time, spanning from around August 2012 to April 2018, magnifying the harm inflicted upon these innocent kids. Ironically, the downfall of these therapists stemmed from their lazy approach to covering up their crimes. Prompted by suspicious claims unearthed by the city health department, the police and FBI launched an investigation, employing a variety of cross-referencing techniques, such as analyzing phone records, GPS data, and travel records, the investigators were able to quickly identify blatant inconsistencies. It became clear that the therapists were nowhere near the supposed locations where the therapy sessions were supposed to have taken place. The attempts at covering up their crimes weren't only feeble, but shockingly inept. One of the therapists, Kadera Doyle, submitted two invoices for simultaneous sessions with different children at separate locations. A clear impossibility. Additionally, she didn't even bother to attend either of the scheduled sessions. Two others, Patricia Hakim and Leobov Belina, were caught red-handed, filing claims while they were out of the country on vacation. Bail amounts were set at significant sums, ranging from $100,000 to $150,000, underscoring the gravity of their offenses. This case will undoubtedly be remembered not for its intricate sophistication, but for its sheer laziness. The callous disregard displayed by these people, coupled with their weak attempts to cover their tracks, only sped up their downfall. With therapists like these, the kids were probably better off anyway. Number two, the Vegas Maid. In a mind-boggling display of stupidity, Amanda Melendez, a hotel maid in Las Vegas, found herself in hot water after allegedly stealing over $1 million worth of belongings from a guest room. The incident unfolded at the Videra Hotel, where three men had requested housekeeping services. Imagine the shock on their faces when they entered the room, only to find their bags turned inside out, beds half-made, and cleaning supplies carelessly abandoned. But that was just the beginning of their nightmare. The real blow came when they discovered that their meticulously hidden jewelry had vanished into thin air. We're talking about two Rolex watches, a Cartier watch, seven diamond Cuban link chains, bracelets, and a gold ring, all gone without a trace. Adding insult to injury, another guest reported that $300 in cash had mysteriously vanished from the same room. How could this happen? Well, it turns out that Melendez, the housekeeper assigned to the room, had a rather incriminating phone conversation with an inmate in prison. And guess what? The conversation revolved around the valuable jewelry she encountered while cleaning the room. Talk about a criminal mastermind. Authorities wasted no time in apprehending Amanda, who now faces charges of grand larceny, burglary, and conspiracy to commit burglary. It's clear that her ill-conceived plan unraveled quickly, leaving her in a heap of trouble. One can't help but wonder how someone could be so foolish as to leave behind cleaning supplies and half-made beds and talk on recorded prison phone calls. Number one, pawning it off. Robert James Rowe, a 39-year-old man from Queensland, Australia, installed seven security cameras at his friend's pawn shop. Six years later, Rowe still had the capability to remotely control the surveillance system using his phone. Exploiting this advantage, he hatched a plan to break into the shop while the owner, Wayne McKellar, and his wife were vacationing in Bali. In November 2013, Rowe deactivated the camera covering the main section of the store, allowing him to enter undetected. Using the keypad he'd installed, Rowe gained access to the shop and made off with a significant haul of $6,300 in cash and jewelry. He thought he had outsmarted the remaining cameras. In an attempt to cover his tracks, Rowe even left a business card on the screen door, creating the illusion that he had just arrived at the lock store and decided to leave his contact information. Unbeknownst to him, Mrs. McKellar reviewed the CCTV footage and uncovered the evidence when she returned. 
While reviewing the video, Mrs. McKellar noticed the side door opening just minutes before Roe placed his business card at the front door. She also observed a suspicious movement of a guitar stand near the location where the stolen items were kept. Following Mr. McKellar's identification of a blue plastic container from the shop in Roe's car, the police promptly made an arrest. Roe was ordered to pay $6,300 in compensation for his crimes. He was also sentenced to 12 months in prison. Maybe shut all the cameras off next time. Robert, click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather have, Popeyes for life or KFC for life.